When you think of sneakers as streetwear, you have to thank one man, number 23, Michael Jordan. Were it not for a skinny kid from North Carolina, we might be all wearing loafers as leisure wear. Modern sneaker culture has its roots in the air. That is, the original Air Jordan 1, that released in 1985. Nike and subsequently the Jordan brand has honored this iconic silhouette numerous times since the release of the Retro 1. To this day, Michael Jordan remains the OG signature shoe king 16 years after his last NBA game and 21 years after his last championship. I'm Nate the Great from TakeFlight214.com and in this video we take a look at just how influential Jordan was to the sneaker game as a whole. We go through all of the innovations that each one of his retro sneakers actually introduced to the game and in the end we give a recap. So don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button before we get started as it does help us grow as a channel. And don't forget to hit the notification bell to be notified whenever we drop new content such as this. So with that, let's jump right in. Before MJ and the Air Jordan, Converse was the top brand. Most guys hooped in them and when you thought the athletic shoe, you thought of Converse. But there was one problem. They didn't look all that hot. Before the days of MJ, everyone played in solid colored sneakers, either all white or all black. Those were the only options offered to you. But 1985 marked a landmark in sports apparel history. It was the year Nike teamed up with what would be the arguable great to release the Air Jordan 1. In fiscal 2018, Nike revenue for the Jordan brand hit nearly $2.9 billion. Part of it coming from buyers who weren't even alive during Jordan's last title run. Today, Jordan brand stretches from shoes to clothing and gear including backpacks, bags, and hats. Nike last, just last year opened a mashup of retail stores and consumer experiences called Jordan LA on downtown Los Angeles on South Broadway which includes shoes and clothing customization, virtual reality training simulation, and a rooftop basketball court. As big as business is now for the Jumpman, to think it almost didn't happen. According to Roland Lazenby, author of the 2014 book, Michael Jordan, The Life, Jordan laughed at the Air Jordan name, hated the look of the shoe, and almost skipped the first meeting with Nike. Jordan's mother, Dolores, was part of a family of former North Carolina sharecroppers who believed strongly in economic empowerment and insisted he attend. And Nike gave him an unbelievable deal of 25% royalty. And it would take years before someone else in the shoe industry would get that, quoted Lazenby. Nike also needed a lot of convincing. In 1984, Jordan had been part of a historic NBA draft that included one of the league's best big men in Hakeem Olajuwon, one of the most dominant power forwards in Charles Barkley, and the league's all-time best at dishing out assists in John Stockton. The fact that Nike would wind up throwing virtually all its shoe marketing money behind Jordan had heart was hardly assured. Lazenby said it took a small gang of Jordan backers, including Nike marketing legend Sonny Vaccaro, to convince a very skeptical Phil Knight, one of Nike's co-founders. Phil Knight was mildly interested at best, but Vaccaro was relentless, and he soon formed an allegiance with Rob Strasser and Peter Moore. They were both at Nike, and they were essential guys in driving the whole Nike idea forward. The third intangible was Jordan's play. He was the guy who could fly, in quotes, stated Lazenby. And if he had not produced in a major way on the court, then none of the other things would have mattered. But that wasn't the end of the potential roadblocks. The NBA actually banned the original Air Jordan for not meeting its stringent league policy for uniform colors. Jordan wore them anyway and faced a $5,000 per game fine as a result. Recognizing a unique marketing opportunity when it presented itself, Nike happily paid the fine, and MJ rocked them all the way to his Rookie of the Year honor. Nike faced a unique challenge in following up the unprecedented success of the original Air Jordan, namely, how to follow them up. 
the popularity of the shoe's namesake, Michael Jordan, already had begun to outgrow his home country, and Nike went to Italy to produce the Air Jordan 2. While this nod to internationally renowned Italian style was the first, and to date only, Air Jordan produced in that country, it wasn't the only first for the franchise. Bruce Kilgore also had designed the Air Force One, and the Air Jordan 2, the first to not feature the Nike familiar swoosh logo. Nike appeared across the top of the hill counter, and the wing logo from the original Air Jordan appeared on the tongue. And if the basketball world was still getting to know Michael Jordan, then the ad campaign surrounding the Air Jordan 3 introduced one prominent playground baller who definitely knew MJ and his increasingly prominent shoes all too well. Released in 1988, the rollout of the Air Jordan 3 included TV spots featuring actor-slash-director Spike Lee as Mars Blackman from his 1986 film She's Gotta Have It, sparking a series of catchphrases hurled around the world of sneakers. Architect-turned-designer Tinker Hatfield took the lead on this one for the first time. The first of more than a dozen of Air Jordans he would go on to design, Hatfield sparked some style trends of the Air Jordan 3 that had continued well into the 21st century. Most notably, he introduced the elephant print overlays on the upper that have resurfaced periodically in reissues of the Air Jordan 3, as well as other models ever since. This was also the very first sneaker to introduce the now iconic Jumpman logo. The sneaker world was introduced to Nubuck with the introduction of the Air Jordan 4. The Air Jordan 4 featured mesh for the first time, increasing breathability. Multiple areas of the Air Jordan 4 featured plastic. A lean triangular plastic piece attached to the Nubuck heel was constructed to a hard plastic lace holder. The lace holder at the forefoot added lockdown. A plastic heel tab that read Nike Air was similar to that of the Jordan 3. Also on the upper, a plastic grid pattern that lay over the breathable mesh and behind the triangular piece. Mars Blackman returned to the ad campaign, marketing the shoe, continuing a relationship that would persist to varying degrees well throughout the 21st century. The Air Jordan 5 was a statement of Michael Jordan's aggressive nature on the court. Released in February 1990 for $125, the Air Jordan 5 featured a shark tooth design on the lateral midsole that designer Tinker Hatfield drew from World War II P-51 Mustang fighter planes. Hatfield also reflected the attitude of aggression both in the traction the shoe offered and the molding foam of the upper. The Air Jordan 5 also introduced the concept of iced outsoles, translucent rubber as well as the inclusion of lace lock toggles. Another first for the Air Jordan 5 was the offset ankle collar, designed to boost support while offering flexibility where a player needed it most. The overall cut of the shoe was higher than previous models. The Air Jordan 6 is a fixture in the basketball history. Released in February 1991, Michael Jordan wore it in the Chicago Bulls first championship just a few months later. And while the sports world focused its attention on MJ's emotional first embrace of the coveted Larry O'Brien trophy, with his father looking on proudly, the sneaker world was trying to catch a glimpse of his feet. While MJ wore the shoe, he averaged 31.5 points per game on his way to a fifth straight scoring title. He also earned first team all NBA, first team all defense, and a 7th straight All-Star appearance to go along with his league MVP honor. And to cap it off, MJ earned MVP Finals, all of which likely paled in comparison to winning the actual chip itself, I'm sure though. Like Michael Jordan, Tinker Hatfield set out to repeat as a winner with the championship caliber design on the Air Jordan 7. Released in 92, the Air Jordan 7 drew inspiration from West Africa's tribal art with bold lines on the midsole. It also incorporated Nike's Hirachi technology, named for a Mexican-style sandal as a Neosphere inner booty <laughs> no homo, to improve, to improve comfort and fit. 
This helped eliminate extra weight and made it one of the lightest basketball shoes at that time. And following their lightest ever shoe, they released their heaviest. One of my personal faves, the Air Jordan 8. The brand returned its padded collar from the Hirachi style of 7s and the inner booty shock returned as well. Also returning was Bugs Bunny in the shoes marketing campaign as the character had previously appeared in the campaign for the previously released 7s. The shoe consisted of a thermoplastic polyurethane support and a polycarbonate plate along with the anti-inversion crossing straps to lock down the foot. The extra padded added extra protection but it also added extra weight. After leading Chicago to a third straight championship in 1993, the maestro walked off the stage. Michael Jordan shocked the basketball world by retiring that October. He signed with Class AA Minor League Birmingham Barons the following February. And as he worked his way through the bus leagues, Nike prepared the Air Jordan 9 to hit the hardwood without him. Penny Hardway, Ken and Gill, BJ Armstrong, and Mitch Richmond each wore an exclusive version of the shoe during the 93-94 season. And a high school senior named LeBron James wore the white, green, and gold colorway to commemorate his high school, St. Vincent St. Mary in Akron, Ohio. The Air Jordan 9 became the first Jordan that the man himself would never wear in competition on a basketball court that is because if you remember they did make baseball cleat versions of them but though ironically it's the Air Jordan 9 that's depicted on the statue of MJ outside the United Center in Chicago. When Michael Jordan returned to the NBA on March 19, 1995 against the Indiana Pacers he wore the Chicago colorway of the Air Jordan 10. The Air Jordan 10's design was very simplistic. It featured clean lines, lightweight cushioning, and an outsole that commemorated his career to that point. The original steel version was designed with a stitched toe piece, which Jordan didn't like, so the subsequent colorways of the Air Jordan 10 had clean toe pieces. Thanks to great performance coupled with an innovative design, the Air Jordan 11, particularly the Concord colorway, is one of the most loved sneakers ever. Soul Collector Magazine voted the 11 the top shoe of all time. Tinker Hatfield watched video of Michael Jordan and noticed MJ's foot would roll off the footbed on hard cuts. So Hatfield took the opportunity to blend substance with style, adding patent leather for the first time on a basketball shoe. Patent leather was stronger and the fit MJ's reported desire to have a shoe that could be worn with a suit. Tinker Hatfield drew from very different areas in design on the Air Jordan 12, taking inspiration from a woman's fashion shoe and a Japanese flag. The 12 is the first to feature the ultra zoom responsive zoom air unit, as well as the lateral and medial support panels designed to work together to create one of the most durable shoes in the signature series. The shoe also had a full length carbon fiber shank like its predecessor. November 1st, 1997, the Air Jordan 13 was loaded with both performance and design elements. Perhaps the most prominent feature was the hologram on the upper that resembled the eye of a panther, while the outsole featured a paw-like design. The 13 also featured zoom air in the heel and forefoot, and a pylon lightweight foam midsole. That and the podular tooling made this possibly the most comfortable Air Jordan in the series. Tinker Hatfield teamed up with Mark Smith on the Air Jordan 14. Introduced during the 1998 NBA Finals, it would be the last shoe Michael Jordan would wear as a Chicago Bull. Jordan hit the famous last shot in the black and red colorway of the Air Jordan 14, sinking the Utah Jazz for the second straight time in the NBA Finals. Michael Jordan announced his retirement on January 13, 1999 prior to the beginning of the lockout shortened season. So designer Tinker Hatfield was once again challenged to design a shoe that MJ would never wear on the court. Hatfield again tapped the aspect of MJ's playing style, this time drawing inspiration from the X-15 fighter plane, which set speed and altitude records through the 1960s. Much like the man himself, 
The Air Jordan line went through a transition with the Air Jordan 15. Michael Jordan transitioned into his role as part-time owner and president of basketball operations with the Washington Wizards, and Wilson Smith III moved into the role of lead designer for the Air Jordan 15. When Michael Jordan resigned as the Wizards' president of basketball operations and returned to the court, he did so in the Air Jordan 16. Wilson Smith III made a return as well as the designer of the Air Jordan 16. A CD-ROM and metal briefcase also were included, contributing to making the Air Jordan 16 the priciest Air Jordan ever produced at the time, with a suggested retail price of $200. It was the first and only Air Jordan to break the $200 barrier of all versions until the XX8 in 2013. The Air Jordan 16 marked another transition for Michael Jordan and his design team, the Jordan brand. The shoe released in 2003 saw MJ's final NBA game and Tate Cuber stepped into the design of the 16th edition of MJ's signature shoe. This may have marked the end of an illustrious basketball career, but it wasn't the end of the release of Jordan sneakers. There will be 14 more editions released up until 2017. And I'll spare you as the retros are the most popular for most people anyway. All these things may explain what originally made Air Jordan popular, but what is the cause of sustained longevity all these years? Three Jordan brand shoes remain among the current top 10 selling athletic shoes. The Jordan 11 Low, the Jordan 1 High OG, and the Jordan 9 Mid according to market research firm NPD Group. As George Belsch, professor and chairman of marketing department at the San Diego State University puts it, what we have here is a once in a generation athlete who has transcended his sport and become ingrained in not only the sports world but in popular culture as well. And I have to agree with him. I think there's also a sense of OG originator status. Jordan was the world's first hype sneaker and sneaker fans realize this and pay homage. So what you think? Which J's are your favorite? Hit us up in the comment section and let us know how you felt about our list and rank your favorite J's from top to bottom. I'm Nate the Great from TakeFlight214.com. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and the notification bell to be notified whenever we drop another video on all things hype culture. So again, from TakeFlight214.com, I am Nate the Great signing out. Until next time, peace.